Hey everyone, Smokas here. We have Colin, the founder of Platform with us today. Hey Colin, good hey, to have you. Nice. Good to have you once again. How are you? Good. Yeah, I've been good. I've done a lot of travel the last couple of weeks, so I haven't been as active as I was hoping to be. But uh, work's been continuing, so that's good. Nice. Thanks for putting your time together to run this webinar for us. I mean, we, we just moved it like once and. Uh, thank you for still making time. I know you have been like having a busy schedule, especially with rolling out like a lot of updates for Platform Lee and your other uh, SaaS product served and still you managed to make some time for the, to do this webinar for us. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for hosting it. Sure. So uh, in today's webinar, we are going to see how uh, I mean, like most of you have uh, started using Platform Lee and some of you uh, still not sure how you can get the max out of platform league and uh, based on the recent poll that we ran it seems that majority of you have issues uh, when it comes to increasing the open rate with platform league so that is exactly what we are going to cover today and uh, Colin is going to show us how to set up your accounts inside your platform league, inside your platform league. say uh, for instance you can send emails from different email accounts inside your platform League account. That is something that not many of us are aware of. So Colin is going to show us how to set up different email accounts inside your platform League account. And he's also going to uh, teach us how to uh, warm up your list. Say you have not sent emails to like for like so long time, you should send them like a warm up email, try to get connected with, with the audience and how to set up the basic automation. So. Uh, the list can do the job for you. The automation can do the job for you when you are not available. And uh, Colin is also going to talk a bit about like personalization. So we are going to cover the basics of all of this today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot them in the chat. But otherwise, we'll just keep moving. And uh, towards the end of the webinar, we'll have an AMA session as well. So Colin, the stage is all yours. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, also, if anyone has any questions, if they're watching this on a replay, then they can just reach out to us on the help desk. Mm -hmm. um, on the support section inside the site. Uh, what I might do probably is, uh, if you want, I could summarize the things that we've been working on since, since we launched um, so in the last month or so, if you want. Sure. So let's just cover some of those things. So the first thing um, that was requested by a lot of people is uh, that was requested was, the ability to add uh, addresses and, and unsubscribes as part of a template was part of an email. So I'm going to show that in a second. Um, let me just share my screen, seeing as we've turned our webcams off. Let's just get that up. Okay, there you go. Okay, cool. So, Uh, Colin, your voice is breaking up. Uh, Colin, we cannot hear you. You're still there? Yep. Yeah, no, yep, I'm still here. Yeah, you're back. Okay. All right. So the first thing that uh, we added, which was requested, was the ability to add um, your own unsubscribe stuff. So on the page that I was on before, let me just go back there and I'll show you again. So we're just going to use Project X. On this page here, you'll see that for each one, you add these unsubscri unsubscription test texts and your address, right? Um, so you do that inside the center profile, and then we add that automatically at the bottom of, of the emails and then link to their subscriber options page. And the subscriber options page allows your your contacts to edit their subscriber info, as well as obviously unsubscribe from that specific list. So people who are using templates when they're sending a mail, so we're gonna have a look at, at that real quick now. Um, when they're sending templates, basically you now have the ability to add in customization for your unsubscribes. So inside your template that you might paste in here, and we're working on the email builder, which we will be released soon. Uh, the reason why it's taking a bit of time is obviously when it comes to email deliverability, which is also part of the topic of this webinar, you want to make sure that, you know, 
the, the HTML's content ratio is good, that all the tags are clean, et cetera, et cetera. So that's part of what's going on with the builder. But you can paste in a template. So you can just go to source, and then you can paste in your HTML here. And then when you come back, then it's going to have it all in there. And what you might have is you might have your own um, opt-outs or addresses, so you don't want it showing with your sender profile one as well. So what our system will do is you'll see that there's a personalization button, okay? And if you click that, you can add in these personalization fields, including you'll see a, a new section, email personalization, which includes your company address and your unsubscribe link. Now, if you include these, it's going to override the default unsubscriptions, okay? So they must include a footer that contains a valid physical mailing address and a clear way on how to unsubscribe. So we include these automatically based on your sender profile information, but if you wish to replace it with a footer that more closely matches the aesthetics of your campaigns, you can use this, right? So by putting that, it's going to put your company address and then some text here as well. Like if, and, and you've got to imagine that you have a design here, but then if you want to just add your own unsubscribe one as well, then you just click the screen personalization, you go back down and you add the unsubscribe link. And that's going to put that there as well, okay? And then you can obviously just move it around, put it wherever you want. So that's one new feature that we added, which gives you the flexibility of not having it in the footer um, in the default area, but you can then put it wherever you want. So Sampath, does that make sense, or does it need more explaining? Keep moving. Okay. And then we've always had this, but what some people probably don't notice is you can personalize your subject line with this and you can personalize your body content with this icon here. So if you're to say, um, uh, check this out and then you put say first name as an example, all right. And if they don't have a first name, that's what this add default value is. So if they, the contact has a first name field filled out, like from my case, it would be Colin. So if it would say, check this out, Colin, uh, then that'll be there. But if it doesn't have that, then you may you can use another alternative, so friend or let's say mate or whatever, being Aussie. And so I noticed that you you say that often as well, mate. <laughs> so we can say like this, right? And then when we send a test email, it's still going to show these because it's not to a real contact. But if you wanted to te then test this email to yourself, you can. But basically, that's going to personalize your email. And you can add that personalization in through the body as well. And it works with uh, custom fields as well. So you can basically personalize with any of the information from the profile. Okay. You can include. Uh, uh, Colin, uh, sorry with the interruption. Uh, yeah. Can you make your screen uh, to the maximum? Because completely. Yeah. Uh, yes. So what I'll do is I'll make my screen much smaller. Okay. And then you should see it bigger. Yep. Much better. Okay. Cool. All right. So it's just these two buttons here that we're talking about and, and personalizing the email like that. And yeah, so the, the other thing, just to make it completely clear, because I don't know if other providers have it, but like if you say, so dear, right? And then we're gonna put in a first name, but I, I can type it in because it's this, or I can just click here and, and insert it. Now, if I do that, right, it's dear first name, comma. But if they don't have a first name in your profile, then it'll just be dear space, comma, which doesn't look as good. So what we've done is we've given you the option to add a default personalization if if one isn't present, which is just going over this again. Okay, so dear first name, dear friend. Okay. And then it's going to obviously use the first name if they have one, and if they don't, it's just going to say dear friend. And you can do that for all the all the fields. Um, and you can also do that on the landing pages as well. So when you link to a landing page, um, so here is a link. So a quick look at how to do that. So if we highlight the link part, we click here, add a link. You'll see here, link personalization. Yes. Okay. So send their first name. And then you will use this in the landing page. So you just copy and paste this into your landing page, whichever landing page you're using, as long as it has the platform you code on it as well. And yeah, and obviously by default, any of our landing pages that you build with. And then you just replace de default with friend or whatever you want. Um, and then, it, then it's going to, or you can just use first name and it will leave a blank space. So then whenever someone clicks on that link, um, it's going to contain that information, that personalization, so you can customize 
the pages that you send them to. Um, yeah, so that's that's there as well. Now, the other features that we've worked on in the last month is the ability for Zapier to support uh, custom fields. So we have custom fields inside of Platformly, and you can create as many as you want. You'll see it up here under contacts, and then clicking on custom fields, you can add more custom fields in here. So we'll have a quick look at that. But basically, it's very simple. You just click add custom field, and then you just create the fields. And this obviously then creates in the CRM system in the contact profile as well that field, and then you can use Zapier to fill those, which opens up a whole host of possibilities that you can use Zapier for that wasn't available before. Uh, the other thing we did was created the public sharing URLs for dashboards. So before on dashboards, you'd only have the ability to share with people who had like a, a login inside of Platformly. So then they'd log in. Now you have the customized dashboard. Let's just pull up uh, one of these as an example. So the way you're going to get to that is by coming in here and you go to settings. You'll see here co copy public URL. And at the moment, before you'd get the, the link and only a team member could log in. Now anyone can access this. So you can share it with clients or your board of directors or prospective investors or, you know, whatever the case may be for, for this dashboard. And you can choose to add a password if you want as well. So then they get a modal that they have to input a password. Uh, let's just have a quick look at that in action. So we'll call this um, just something like that. And we'll copy the URL. Okay, paste that. You see here, it requires the password. Do the password that we set up. And there's the access. Okay, so then people can see all of this sort of immediately from here. Uh, you can make it full screen, you can bookmark it, you can put it on a TV. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the browser works as well, so we've got a Chrome extension, and you'll see the dashboards here too. Okay, so it's, it's a very fast, easy way for you to see inside your business. We've also added the last refresh time. Um, we refresh your dashboards very often. All right, so there's that feature. Uh, any questions so far, Sunpath, or should I just keep going through? Good. Okay, so then here's the other thing. Uh, we've got the WordPress, our, pl our plugin is officially launched in the WordPress directory. So you can come here, you just search for Platformly or platform.ly, and uh, you'll see the version here. And then you can just download it, you can see exactly what it can do, you can see the screenshots. So this allows you with your WordPress site, for example, to very quickly and easily insert um, like your landing pages that you build, you can just create them into pages. You can do it for pop-ups as well. You can choose how you want your pop-ups to come in. So this is with the opt-in forms. Um, and you can then set like how long you want them to stay open for, what pages you want them to appear on, etc. You can also add event code in very easily into all your pages. And you'll see here there's also this button added, platformly is added onto your onto the CK editor so that you can very quickly and easily put in event code wherever you want uh, to track events. So all of those things are inside the plugin and they're available for you to download from the WordPress store right away and connect it with your platform account. The other thing that we've done is we've moved the lead score from better into production. And lead score is a big topic all on itself and that probably needs its own webinar to discuss setting up lead score. So we're not gonna do it in this webinar. What you can do is you can see that if you come uh, and you, you choose a project first, and then you come across where it says lead scoring. And what a lead score does is it allows you to set up uh, a way of grading your contacts to see who might be at risk of churning, who your top contacts are, who you should reach out to, who's most likely to be like a, an advocate for you, et cetera, et cetera. So who do you wanna reach out for testimonial? You'll see here, this is where you build it. So first, obviously it's project based, so you can set up one lead score per project, and then you're gonna select an action. So, you know, do, do they open an email? Did they join your system? Are they added to a certain tag? Um, did they purchase a certain product? Did they make a refund? Did an event fire, as we've just talked about setting up event? Uh, did they open a specific email? All of these things, you'll just go through and you set that up, and then you'll say how many points they get for that, okay, for that action. And does the score degrade, degradate? So basically what that means is over time, uh, you can 
remove a percentage of that score. So if you say uh, 1% daily, then this one point is going to become worth 1% less per day. So after 100 days, that, that's going to be gone after them, them doing this action. Or you can say no, and then they'll always have that one point as their score. Okay. And then the next point is score every time or unique. So the way this works is... Let's say it's open an email or click to link, and you say unique, it'll only record, it'll only give them one point for doing that action, even if they open the email five times. If you say every time, then it'll give them five points if they open it five times. And obviously you just add multiple actions, and then you'll save your lead score, and then it's gonna start scoring up your leads as they, as, and, and your contacts as they take action. So this is very, very powerful, but it's a very big topic, okay? So it's available for everyone right now. It's, it's uh, put on live. So we're still considering it in beta, but it's in production. So you can use it right away. So you're just going to go over to your setup, choose your project, and then click on add lead scoring setting, and you're going to create your lead score. Okay. So um, Sampath, what do you think about that? No, the lead score. Do you think it's a, a nice, strong feature that, that people should start implementing straight away? Yes, totally. Uh, but I think that people would need like... Uh, I mean, like maybe like once we start, people start using lead scoring function. There will be like a lot of questions around that, and maybe we should do like a webinar, like Facebook Live, sometime just to cover yes. the topic. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that that's a, a whole topic of itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so more updates that have taken place in the last month. Uh, also, the ability to contact to to contact filter by lead score. So under your view contacts in your projects you'll then be able to see the, the contact lead score and you can filter based on that. Let's see if this other one has some contacts because we've got dummy contacts in here uh, to make sure, yeah, okay, cool. And then from here, so you'll be able to start seeing the, the lead score here. And you'll be able to sort by it and you'll be able to filter. So um, when, you, when you go down here, you see this new section down the bottom here, lead score, uh, minimum lead score and maximum lead score. So that you can set up a filter and then contact just those subscribers or and, and so on. And then obviously you can even add as a tab as well for certain lead score points. So maybe you want ones who are less than five, ones who are more than 20, or whatever your lead scoring system is. And then based on that, you'll be able to come and view those contacts at all times and contact them by selecting here and then sending them all an email or whatever you want to be doing with them, okay? Uh, the other things that we've worked on is uh, given you a file of failed imported emails. So when you go to import your emails, uh, some people were having issues where they didn't know which ones failed and why. So now when you come here and you want to import your contacts into Platformly, you can go here and you'll see import contacts. Then when you upload a file, so you can actually upload it, as we ask you to answer two questions first and confirm that, that it is your confirmed opt-in list and you have permission to contact. But you upload a file here, any of the emails that fail, we run them through internal checking systems. You will receive uh, reason which ones did fail, okay? So that's a, a new improvement that we've added, and also you'll find the reason why they failed, okay? Uh, then the other things that we've done is uh, added, inside of landing pages, we've created a third option, which allows you to get landing page HTML. So when you're creating a landing page, if you want to host it, you want to self-host it, or, you know, like, let's say that just an FTP upload, you want to upload a file or something like that, uh, to your own server, you can do that. So when you create a landing page, when you go to publish the landing page, you're going to have uh, an option to, to just get the HTML code, which uh, gives you a lot of flexibility to, to later edit it, to host it wherever you want, you know, take it to any other, any other host, etc. So those are the, the main things that we've achieved so far. And there's a lot of tasks that are making a lot of progress that are behind the scenes that are going to be going live in the next month, uh, as well as, of course, we fixed a lot of bugs and, and, and things like that that were reported by you guys. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and, yeah, we're pretty happy with where we're at with the system right now. Okay, so, Sambath, how was that for, for an update of what's been going on for the last month? Yeah, that that's really uh, very informative, if you ask me. But uh, I have a small suggestion to make here uh, it'll be really really nice if you could start sending like more emails say at least like twice a month uh, posting us yes, updates on how often platform has been rolling out some updates because 
that will pave way for most of us to start using the features that we are we were unaware of. Coding is something that uh, we, we all could use from day one. But uh, it'll be great if you can just keep communicating with us more via emails so that we can start using the features and we can bring in like more questions or, or bring in like more suggestions uh, to platform D either via webinars or the group or via like chat support. So we all have like a lot of questions. We all will always have like a lot of questions and suggestions to make, but we just want like to be communicated more from from your side. Yep, yep. That, that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And so we see here we have to see what's new. Uh, sorry, you broke out in between. What was that? Yeah, there's a see what's new button at the bottom here at the bell. Yep. And if you click this, uh, we're going to be updating this more often as well. So okay. we've published, as you know, the roadmap, but we're going to start doing monthly updates for, for users as well. Got gotcha. you. And then announcements in here as well as, as we go through things. Okay. Perfect. And if anyone hasn't claimed this yet, if it's still available, mm -hmm. you should come grab it this uh, this free credit offer. So I link it to it. Back. Back. So the free credit is back now? Yep, it's got the updated info there as well with the new um, password and things like that. So I'm not gonna publish it here, but yeah. So now it's now it's back until it gets shared again. <laughs> but, yeah. Great. Okay, uh, then the other things that we wanted to talk about is, are there any questions there for me, Sampath? Nope, there's not many questions. We, are, we can just keep moving. Okay, well, I've done the update part. So what's the next section you want to talk about? Uh, well, I want to cover more about uh, how we can set up the personalization so that we can uh, stay interactive with, the, with our audience. Okay. How, how exactly we can personalize, uh, and what are the personalization options? available inside the platform leave for us to connect with the audience. Yeah, so to personalize your emails is, is kind of the part that I showed before, um, where you can put in all the personalization. So what, what other types of personalization would you like me to show? Overview of personalization. Um, okay. Well, yeah, obviously, I mean, you could create personalized automations and then personalized emails, which we discussed. I guess, I guess you also wanted to talk about how to get higher open rates. Am I right? Okay. All right. So, so that's not personalization, but that's, uh, sending, um, tips, I suppose. All right. So let's, let's talk, let's talk about some sending tips then. We'll go to create a new email and send. And then from here, um, when you put your content, you'll notice there's this button here called check spam score. It's good to, to click that before you send because what that's gonna do is that's going to outline uh, any issues with your email content. So that's very important to do. But then more, more important than that in the initial setup is when you add your domains that you want to send to and reply from, so we'll go and have a quick look at that now as well, is you want to make sure that they are not on any blacklists and so on, and our system will actually do that for you. So I'm going to show you that right now. If we go back here. Okay, so let's just choose one of these. When we click Edit, so, so we add these in, we add our from and our reply to, okay, which you then confirm afterwards. If we then click Save Changes, it's going to take a little bit of time, but this is for your benefit because what it's doing is it's going to go and it's going to check uh, those domains against blacklists, your sending domains, to make sure that you're going to be good to get high deliverability rates there. So we'll just wait for that to come back. And whilst it's doing that, uh, Sampath, I have some other things to discuss as well. So basically, there's for getting a good sender reputation. Uh, now, I've been fortunate enough with partners and with myself and then uh, projects that I've co-founded, we sent probably well in excess of a billion emails over the last decade. So, you know, we spent a lot of time figuring out what works and, and so on. Um, and obviously it's constantly changing. But you see here, so email format check, okay, it's fine, IP lookup. So this, your IP is not on any blacklists, uh, the domain URL is not on any blacklists and the email is valid. So then you can confirm and save it and then you'll confirm your sender profile so that they go to active. Okay, so that's the first step to make sure that that's like that. 
Now, from our side, let's talk about what we do. Uh, obviously, when, you, when you're sending email, you get a sender reputation score. Our scores are all 99 at the moment, which is basically the, I mean, it's the top, it's the best you get. And what we've done is we've set up with all of the top ESP, uh, sorry, email, yeah, email service providers like uh, Gmail, Hotmail, et cetera. We have accounts with all of them in, for Postmaster accounts and we've got all our IPs registered with them. And if there's any, ever any issues, we get flagged immediately. Uh, every day we scan all blacklists online um, and so far we haven't hit any blacklists, but basically behind the scenes, our job is to keep the mail sending IPs uh, off any blacklists and with a very high sender reputation. Uh, that's what an ESP, that's their, their primary function, okay? So that's what we do for you guys, our customers. And then, of course, if, uh, if it hits any blacklists, then what we do is we take those IPs out of circulation so you don't send over those anymore, and we reach out and we get those cleaned we get them removed from the blacklist, we get them back on the whitelist, and then we add them back into the rotation pool. Now there's obviously a lot of complex things that goes in behind that as well. So for example, there's an uh, IP and IP warmups. Uh, basically what that means is you can't start emailing 100,000 emails on the first day, right? As a, as a, with, with a dedicated IP address. So if through our system you can, because we, we handle all the warmups, we control all the warmups, we control the, the sending throttling through the IPs. So you don't have to worry about that. But if, for example, under sending mailers, you decided to uh, say that you wanted to handle your own emailing, uh, which you can do with us as well. So if you add in your own um, SMTP service, let's say you use SendGrid, MailJet, Amazon, Elastic Email, any of those, okay? Uh, and then what happens is, let's say that you get a dedicated IP. So you have the choices of sending, like, getting free services and using the, the shared mailer, in which case uh, our, our sender reputation is obviously going to be, I would think, better because we're very actively monitoring. I mean, they are as well, so you'd still get a, a decent result. But then if you want to go with dedicated, you should only consider that if you're sending minimum 150, 200,000 emails a month. That's the very minimum. You should be sending more than that if you want to start going dedicated, in my opinion. Um, but then what's involved is you sign up to one of those services all right, so you might go to SendGrid, for example, or Mail, MailJet. You sign up, you request a dedicated IP, which will cost you a bit of money every month, and then you can set your own DKIM and SPF records, and then you have to manage your own throttling. The way we do it for you is we've got a very complex back-end system. Uh, just the software alone that we bought for this was over $20,000 plus $5,000 a year in, in just like licensing fee. Uh, and then obviously that sits on our mail sending servers and connects to our dedicated IP addresses and we have a whole pool of, of IP addresses. Um, so there's a lot that goes on in the back end and we set the DKI, DKIM and SPFs and we manage all that for you on your behalf. So when you click send and platformly, we're handling all that stuff for you. Now if you add in your own and you decide to go the dedicated IP address route, that's the way that you can get your own DKIM and SPF record set. Okay, so then you would add your domain name inside of MailJet, you'd get it verified, you'd add in, in those, those settings on the MX, and then you'd be responsible for your own sending score, which is great because then other people can't negatively affect yours, but it also means you, know, you can negatively affect your own one as well, and you also need to monitor things like IP address warm-ups. So then you have to start mailing slowly and increasing it every single day, all right? And also there's other things to note on that as well. So, for example, there's some providers out there that will only allow 800 emails from one IP per day into, into their system and then the rest they'll bounce. So if you're only sending from one IP and you happen to have, you know, 2,000 email addresses of, of that particular provider, then uh, those, those ones won't get delivered. You have to spread those out over multiple or you have to have a queue system. So that starts getting complicated. So your choices are either using these services with their shared um, ones, which is basically like you pay them, but you don't get dedicated, uh, or just using Platformly, where we manage all that for you, and you can be sure that we're managing the pool, we're keeping the IPs clean, we're monitoring the sender reputation, we're in contact with all of the um, the main providers. Um, so you can just use us. Otherwise, if you want to go dedicated, if you really want to set your own DK, IM, and SPF, then you have to know that there's some pitfalls as well. And, and you need to know what you're doing. So I wouldn't advise that unless you're sending large quantities of email.
So, so far, so far, does all that make sense? Do you have any questions about where we're at so far? Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, first one is from Fordham. Fordham mm -hmm. wants to know if Platformly would work with Spark Post. Uh, Spark Post. Well, it works with any SMTP provider. So they give you, you see here, so these are the ones we have. So in terms of if they give you a SMTP host and a username and password, then yes, it'll work with that. You just come here, you select provider custom, and then you put in the, these details here. So most likely it'll be a TLS encryption, uh, SMTP host, the port that they give you, and your username and your password. Okay, and then obviously any limit that you want to want to set, the max that you want to send, and then you'll save the service. But yeah, if you put it under custom, you should be able to do it. Provided they provide you with this information, you can use any SMTP. I hope that answers for them your question. Um, Sasha, I think, yeah, Sasha, uh, he has a question. Uh, would there be a difference in the delivery rate if I'm using an SMTP server versus a uh, platform based server? Uh, sorry, just one second. I'm just trying to see where you are there. Uh, audio is choppy from Colin's side. Ross, is it still choppy or is it okay? And also, I'm glad that you like the HTML export. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a pretty cool feature because it gives you kind of maximum flexibility what you're going to do with your pages. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is there a different? Is there any difference for delivery with the SMTP service? So uh, basically, well, Mailgun versus Amazon and so on. Right, okay, I understand. So I would say to a degree, yes. So for example, in my, in my experience and with talks that I've had with these providers, uh, Mailjet seemed to really focus very, very much on their deliverability rates. So they're not the cheapest provider, but they, they really try and, and make sure that, you know, they diagnose as much as possible why you're not hitting the inbox or why you're only hitting the promotions box, et cetera, et cetera. So MailJet's obviously a very good provider. Uh, Amazon SES, now in my testing with Platformly, we actually do better than, than SES from my testing, but it's important to note that they only also allow ideally transactional emails. So they don't really like marketing emails and uh, they're a bit finicky, which means that they can potentially suspend your account if you know if you're um, you get a couple of spam complaints, or if they don't like the you know, and then if they manually review it and they see that it's not really transactional and maybe promoting some sort of a product or something, they could suspend your account. Um, but generally, if they don't suspend your account, they they, they generally uh, have pretty good sending score. But I mean, even even though they're big guys, you know, like as I said in, in my tests, we we. We've inboxed better than Amazon has. Um, so really, a lot of it depends. In terms of, of differences here, I, I'd say it's the standard of who they let in um, on those IPs that you're sending from as well if you're doing shared IPs. So you could get unlucky and you could end up with a spammer. And, and if one of these services are not as vigilant as the other ones, um, then, yeah, that could affect, negatively affect you. And then the other thing would be how quickly they remove any any IPs that are having problems and work on fixing those up and so on. But I'd say in general, they would all be pretty good. Um, I suppose with some of the top providers, each of these would have their own internal reputations with them based on how efficient their team is at, at ensuring that no spam is sent. But I wouldn't know which you know what that involves. I just know that MailJet has a whole department actively monitoring everything because I've been in contact with them and chatted with them. Um, and also Elastic Email uh, seemed to be pretty good. But in general, I'd say, it, going back to your question, uh, if there's any difference, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hit and miss. And that's why it's good that a lot of them have free tiers. So what you can do if you want to is you can add, sign up for a free account with a lot of them and add up to their free tiers and then make sure that here under the limit uh, of, here yeah, under the limit, make sure that you set I like let's say a thousand email less than their limit or something like that to ensure. And also an important thing to check is some of them actually have a daily sending limit. So they might say, oh, you can send 30,000 a month, but then they daily limit you to a thousand a day. Um, so you just need to be aware of that as well. But I test out multiple ones if you want to go that route. Uh, to be honest with you, there, there's that option. Otherwise you could just use the, let us handle all that for you. Um, 
unless you're wanting to do your own dedicated. And then if you're doing dedicated, then I'd say the providers are all pretty much similar as long as they allow you to, and they all would with a dedicated IP, set your own DKIM and SPF and have some onboarding and help you out with it, you know, um, and possibly even allow you to have some sort of a warm up protocol. Uh, does that answer those questions? It does for me. I'm just seeing if I, there are I, any. I see there's one question here. Are the landing pages mobile responsive yet? Yeah. Um, many of them are. Most of them are. We might have missed a couple. Um, but yeah, that's that's actually one of the big work ons at the moment. We've brought on a new front end developer and we're actually full time working with two developers on, on the builders. So that includes a landing page builder, uh, email builder, which will come out at some point soon and also the opt-in form builder as well. So those three builders are all heavily under, under improvement at the moment. And we're also getting more templates created. We're getting, at the moment, we're working on add to cart templates, um, which will hopefully, I mean, you know, it, it takes time, but they're definitely coming out, okay. Colin, you are reading this question. There's a question from Fordham. Um, which question? Uh, there's, there's a recent one from Foden about uh, Black Friday. I actually don't see that at all in my question list. Maybe it's a bit slow to update. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, Sasha wants to know if you have an update on convert box integration. Yeah, so the last I heard from Dean Saunders, who's the founder of ConvertBox, that they have a, a, a busy public roadmap, but I guess if, if we can, so in terms of ConvertBox integration, we've changed our third party form code to work inside their system, which means that you can use it by going, you, basically if you create yourself a opt-in form, um, under Project X there won't be any, but you know, if you come here, oh yeah, there is, okay, there's a test. So if I go here, I go publish, I have a third party integration. Yeah, that's fine. This code here will now work inside of ConvertBox. We had to change it to work with their system because they operated slightly differently to, to the other providers that I've noticed. Uh, but but you, you can use ConvertBox with this code now uh, using their HTML add-on, but as for a native integration, which obviously we would really like and you know would really love to have, that's up to ConvertBox and their development team to add platformly into them. So what would be really amazing is if if you are a ConvertBox user to once again just go and request it there with them or on the support desk or something like that, like just give them a nudge to say that you'd like that integration because that that would be pretty awesome for us as well. Um, and and we'll obviously try and follow up again with them, but. I think you know they, they're more looking to hear from users who want to who want to have that. Great. Uh, meanwhile, mm -hmm. I happened to notice that yesterday or day before yesterday, ConvertBox had an issue that the, uh, the the CTAs are not loading up properly. So maybe like Dean is getting busy on that. Plus, he has been rolling out other updates. So uh, what Colin mentioned just now is the current workaround, but. Let's keep the fingers crossed for platform integration to come up soon because I would love to use uh, both the products together as well. Yeah, I think that the trick would be to just keep contacting and reaching out to them and asking if they can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then that'll be amazing if we can have a few guys doing that. That'll be very helpful because I'm pretty sure, you, you know, they prioritize their, their roadmap based on demand. Um, and also, just so you know, Sampath, I don't see any of those questions. Uh, no, we don't have any new questions as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's see. All right. So so that covers that part of, um, for, in terms of the ESP, which is is us, we're the the email service provider. So if you're using platform, these default mailer. Okay. Um, as you can see, I majority use that in, in this in this account here. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what that means is not only do we handle the, the pools of, of IPs and, and monitor it from that side, we also, uh, one thing that we do and, and other providers do as well, is we manage our IPs based on better senders. 
So our best senders go on our best IPs, our top tier IPs. But all of our IPs at the moment are the same. They're all top sender score and they're all, everything's perfect on all of them. So that's nothing to, to think about at the moment. But uh, we have further internal protocols to ensure that people who are not sending spam are always going to get sent out on, you know, amazing IPs. That That's one of our core focuses. Uh, so also what we have built in, because obviously we do, we have a pool of IP addresses and our users use those. And as we grow, we increase the pool and, and, and so on. You know, that's all managed by our backend team. But we also have to protect that pool from people who potentially are not mailing with the best practices. So what that means is there's people who are using or abusing the platformly system will get banned from using the platformly mailer. And then they'd have to come in and add their own third party SMTP in order to send out emails. Okay. Um, obviously there'll be a warning first and then obviously, you know, you can dispute it and we can discuss it and then, and then reinstate you. We're not looking to ban anyone, but we have to protect, the you know our customers and so if you send non-spam emails you'll be very happy to hear that because obviously we've got your back and we're trying to make sure that you get the best possible send rates okay so we have when emails bounce over a certain percent or when people click this is spam over a certain percent internally we have an automatic system that automatically prevent access from to, to using the platform emailer and a message in, inside the account on how they can reach out to us and try and resolve the problem, okay? So it's best not to get to that point. If you do get that message, don't worry, we can still work with you and, and figure out how to get you using platform mailer again. Um, and if not, then you can go to the, the third party SMTPs. But it's very unlikely that you'll get that message. I just want people to know that that is in place as well. So you as normal senders, can be happy in the fact that we're very much protecting the IPs, okay, um, and, and and the sending reputation. That's we have someone full time working on our sending reputation. So that's from the side of the ESP, uh, and then there's obviously a lot that you can do as the email sender, and we'll talk about that in in, in a minute. But just before we do, I wanted to ask you, Sampath, quickly: Are there any any questions that you have from our side of the the ESP? and what we do to keep mail clean and, and so on and so forth and, and deliver mail. Or have I kind of covered that? Uh, yes, you did. Uh, in fact, I think it's important to highlight that people can still get the uh, email list verified credits, which they can use like uh, to credit. Yes. They can use the credits to clean up their email list. But I'm just curious about one other thing that would it be possible to uh, integrate uh, email list verify or email list validation directly with platform D? So the email gets uh, cleared once in a month. I mean, say we can set up a schedule so it gets cleared like automatically once in a month. So we don't have to worry about the uh, high bounce rate. Would that be doable? Yes, yeah, it is. So, so for the credits, um, you see down here on, on this little bell, if you click the bell, it'll tell you, it'll give you the coupon code and where to sign up to claim it. That'll give you 15,000 free credits. It may not still be valid by the time you're watching this, if you're watching it as a replay. Um, but in any event, it's worth getting credits at email list verify. And then you come over here under integrations. And so Sam, I hear what you're saying. You want to automatically do it. The only reason we haven't done that is not to spend people's credits unless they really want to. But you'll see if you go into email list verify, um, you can then choose the project. So whichever project it is. So in our case, we were working on uh, project X. And from their contacts, they're in a certain segment. Okay, so they contain a segment or don't contain a segment, etc., uh, or have the below tags. So contains any segment, contains any tag. Okay, this one is the one that doesn't have. Let's try this one. Okay, so you got eight contacts. Save and run now. Yes, I'm sure. And this is then going to send those contacts, all of the matching contacts, to email list verify to process them. And then on the history tab, we'll be able to see the results of that. Okay, so you can see it here. Um, and you can see how many how many failed, how many processed, how many cleaned, how many failed. And you can click on the fail to see see which ones those are. Um, so then that, that's automatically for you, done for you. But the other very important thing to note at, at this juncture, I think, is there's multiple ways of adding leads inside of platforming. So the first way is importing contacts. Okay, so you can import them. You can get them to opt in via an opt-in form. You can get them to opt in via the API. 
So if you have a membership site or anything like that, you can do that. And obviously, you can get them to opt in via third party opt in forms and so on, where you create the code once here and use them wherever you want. So those are the ways that they can come into the system. Um, but then, and, and through obviously connecting to any, any other integration that we have, when we add them into the system, we more or less do what email, uh, email list verify does in the first time, right? So the only thing we don't do is check spam trap databases. Um, but we check that the emails are valid. We check that the, um, the, the email exists. You know, we, we run them through a whole background check. So we kind of handle that a lot of that for you, which is why we had to build in the feature of telling people why some emails don't import. Um, because we do have a block list on uh, emails that are temporary emails. So you get services out there called throwaway emails that are valid for 30 minutes, an hour, you know, a day, a week, you know, whatever. And basically, it's where people set up a mailbox in order to use that to opt into a bunch of things. And then that expires after a week and then it starts bouncing. So obviously, that's very bad for your sender score. So we, we block that. But we also, you know, a whole bunch of other checks as well. And that's all included for you. Um, to ensure that when the leads come in initially, they're good leads. The only thing that we can't check because, you know, I mean, obviously uh, it's, it's databases and databases of information and that's not what our focus is, is things like spam traps and things like that. And also after a lead has been in the system for a while, uh, they, they can, they degregate as well. And a lot of, you know, email addresses fall into, into the abyss. So that's why you want to ongoing check with email list verify, like, once a month, as Sam Path says, or something like that, you know, um, for, for all your lists to make sure that you are, you're staying on top of that. But in the beginning, at the start, we kind of check it for you as well. So that's just something that isn't advertised anywhere and, and you, no one knows, but it's obviously just to protect our system and it ensures that you pretty much get clean leads. The other thing I would recommend um, whilst we're talking about this topic is when you're creating an opt-in form, uh, so let's go and have a quick look, is that you make it, um, you make it double opt-in. So this is your choice, but it's it's probably something I recommend. So under settings, you'll see double opt-in form, make this a double opt-in. And then email content, you can edit the email. And here you see, so action required, please confirm your email, confirm by clicking the link below. Here's the confirmation link. And so you can edit this, right? Um, and then when they click on that, it either goes to a default URL, your own thank you page. So then you enter a new URL here or specific PLY landing page that you've created, um, like a thank you page. Uh, so it'll say, thank you for confirming your email. Please check your email again uh, for your, your product or whatever, you know. So this is a good option as well, double opt-in form to ensure that the email address is coming in, other people are actually requesting it. And the way you get that is when you're creating the opt-in form under settings, general opt-in settings, you just enable this function here, okay? Make sense? Sam, how are we? All good? Yeah. Uh, any plan for integration with email list validation? That's a question from Ross. So, uh, you know what? A workaround, if I can suggest, email list verify and email list val validation is the same company. So, what I would recommend doing is reaching out to email list verify and asking if they can switch your credits from email list validation to email list verify. Um, I don't know if they will or not. But in terms of integrating, I mean, just to integrate the email list verify and set it up like this took us a, a very long time. It was a lot of code and a lot of work. So we possibly could do email list validation, but as it's the same company anyway, um, yeah, maybe you could just ask them to switch the credits over. Otherwise, if, if, if a lot of people prefer email list validation for whatever reason, even though it is the same system, uh, we can look at that. So yeah, I, I guess if we, we, you'll see our roadmap, we have roadmap.platform.ly, but also on feature requests. I know that some people have requested. So uh, this this top one here is something that we're starting to look into now. Um, we'd rather integrate with CRM systems, but I understand that it's proved to be quite quite a popular request. So that's what we're busy looking into at the moment. Um, uh, so let's just go to search. So now this. Okay, so it's only got three upvotes at the moment. Um, uh, Colin, I have another question. So, uh, Coca integration, 
with platform is like 100% ready now. And we made an announcement uh, last week in the group. So, uh, but but I don't see the option to integrate with Quokka from platform leave from here. So how does it work? That That's on Quokka's side. Okay. So, so you log into Quokka. Integrate. Uh, let's quickly, uh, let's see if, because I have an account, but I haven't, uh, I haven't set it up yet, so that's kind of cool because, well, actually, and I don't have the login URL. Uh, I assume it might be app. All right. Try that. Okay, so when we go through here, you'll see email provider when you're setting it up. And I'm actually going to make training on this as well. And there's platform. So you just click connect. And then you go through connecting it. Um, you see, so paste your platform your API key. That's the first step. And the way you get your platform the API key is by going inside under your profile API docs and keys. And then you'll just create one. You'll call it Quarka. And then you'll come up here and you'll paste it in here, connect, and then do step two. I'm not going to connect it now because I want to make a little video and showing people how to do it. Uh, but basically, it's from their side. Simple. I have not integrated my account either, so I just want to be sure. Thank you. Thanks for showing that. So, um, otherwise, I think we are all good, and we don't have any new questions. So, okay. guys, before we wind up, do you do any of you have like any questions? Just let us know. Yeah. So, actually, Sampat, time has flown, uh, but but you know we're talking about higher open rates. So. Yep. The, key to it, the key to it is there's two parts. One is your ESP, which in this case it's platformly if you're using our platform emailer, or an SMTP if you're using that. And if you are using an SMTP, you've got two options. You've got the shared option or you've got the dedicated option. The dedicated option, it costs more money um, because you have to buy your own IP address. Obviously, you rent it. Um, and also requires you to warm up your IPs and set your own DKIM and SPF and so on. If you're doing the shared option with an SMTP, you don't need to do that. And if you're doing a shared option with us, or if you're using the platform emailer, we sign your mail for you, we handle all of that. So I just wanted to explain that we're doing a lot of stuff in the back end that isn't visible, so that you know that you can trust us with your mail. Um, so you don't have to go and use an SMTP, you can use platform mail, right? Um, that's the ESP side of things. So we completely cover you and handle you on the, the, the ESP side. The next side of things is on how you mail out, right? Uh, now, we've touched on a couple of things, but I just want to quickly go over a few key topics. So we're running a bit late, but I'm going to spend maybe five minutes on this real fast. And then what I think we'll do is we'll create a blog post and a guide to help you guys manage your deliveries, okay? But um, basically, one of the, the main functions that you must focus on is list hygiene. So I recently read an interesting article by a senior email strategist, and they said that brands that avoid culling inactivities, so inactives on their list, often experience a host of problems, including increased balance rates, prevalence of recycled spam traps, which is what we were talking about before, which is why ELV can help, um, inflated complaint rates, and then, of course, you're going to have deliverability problems if you have those issues, right? So list hygiene basically means making sure that you're only mailing to people who want to receive your email. So emailing with a, with a relative frequency, and if you don't email for a very long period of time, uh, if people don't open your email, let's say that you're sending an email once, once a week or once a month, okay, let's say once a week uh, to uh, your list. If people don't open your email for, for six months, then those people you shouldn't be mailing anymore. You know, You should only mail people that, that occasionally interact and open your email. And that's very important, you know, because otherwise in that six months they could have, that email could have turned into a spam trap. Uh, and then you're just going to really hurt your sender score. Um, so that's very important, list hygiene. And of course with our contacts, and our filtering of contacts, you can do that very easily in here. So you, you click this little plus button and then you go to activity. Okay, and then you say, no activity for the last 180 days. Add. Okay, like that. And then we're going to give it a tab name. Okay. 
And 180 days is very generous. I mean, I know people who do 30 days or 60 days or even or max 90 days. So 180 days is like, it's, it's quite a lot that you'll see. Then it's going to create this tab for you. And then you can always see those subscribers who haven't been active in the last 180 days. Now, these are not real subscribers, so they, they all fit under that, right? Um, but, but this then takes us to our next point, which is um, basically re-engaging re your inactive subscribers. So it's important to, to work on re-engaging your inactive subscribers. Now, uh, first, first for list, list hygiene, we did do a blog post on it, and I thought it's probably a good idea if I just shared that. So you'll, you'll find, if you haven't subscribed to our blog yet, we, we're starting to ramp up the content. Obviously, we're a new service, so content's coming, um, and we're focusing on quality. So this article here, uh, email marketing tips, how to clean your email list, okay? So this is email list cleaning tips. It's going to tell you that it's going to allow you to improve your open and click rates, reduce your spam, and improve your porting. The other thing is, of course, you pay for contacts inside of Platformly. So if you have lots of inactive contacts who haven't interacted with you in any way in the last six months after, or let's say not only six months, but how many times you email them, that's another point. If they don't open your email for like 10 or 12 or 15 emails in a row, then they're gone for you, you know? So you shouldn't waste your, your resources contacting them. You shouldn't reduce your opening click rates by mailing their email anymore. Uh, you should basically remove them, unsubscribe them, okay? And, and the way you can do that actually is you go here and then you click unsubscribe. And that will allow you to unsubscribe all, all of the ones who are still subscribed. But uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't waste your, your effort, your time, and ruin your sending scores and, and, and delivery rates by emailing people who don't want to hear from you. So we talk about all of this here. So we talk about hard bounces and soft bounces. And you'll find all of that on this blog post. Okay. Remove inactive recipients. So we talked about that now, we've just done that. And then a re-engagement campaign. That's what I wanted to start talking with you at the moment, okay? So you've got to try and reach out to your subscribers prior to any sort of inactivity cutoff. So whatever you said is the inactivity, try and reach out to them. Um, make sure that you get your messaging and your timing right. So give them the best chance of seeing it and opening your email. And try different subject lines. Um, Try engaging ones that are going to get them to open. And then once the time expires, at the end of the six months, send an, send an email with the subject line like, I'm removing you from my list, or action required, or I have to delete you. Something that really gets them to see it in the inbox. Okay, if I really want to stay on this list, I have to open this email. And if they don't open that email, then it means that, that they are fully inactive. You know what I mean? So that, that's quite an important tip. Wouldn't you agree, Sampath? Okay, anyway, so also don't hesitate to split test your subject, lines. Your subject lines. Uh, you can try incentives, you can try rewards, you can try calls to actions, carrot, stick, you know, all, all that kind of stuff as I've just talked about. And also don't wait too long before executing your, your re-engagement campaign. So don't, don't wait more than sort of three months of no activity before you start really trying to re-engage them, okay? Uh, and you can implement several re-engagement campaigns as well. So at various different points in the customer life cycle, if they're dropping off once they're a customer, you might have different rules than if they're dropping off when you know they're just a lead who's opted in on your blog as a single opt-in. So you know if they're a lead who's just opt-in, you might uh, stop mailing them if they haven't responded to you after five outreaches, you know, um, or 30 days or whatever. If they're a customer, you're going to want to give that a lot longer. And what we can do here as well, if I edit this, I can also add in here has the tag or the segment. So if they're an active in an active segment. Um, that means they're an active member, then, then I want them here. And if they're not, then I want them in, in another one that they're going to get deleted from. You see what I mean? So you can treat them differently using the filter. Okay. Um, and another way is don't email all your inactive subscribers in one blast. Okay. So that's very, very key. When you're doing a, a re-engagement campaign, you want to make sure that you, to avoid raising too many flags, you send send to like percentages of those lists. Okay, don't don't outreach to all of them at the same time. Okay, and also another important point is don't send out of date information. Okay, which basically means, um, and, and this is this is a very important one because this is probably the leading cause of deliverability failures uh, that will damage your sending reputation. Um, so any sort of outdated text, 
broken images, broken links. Um, if, if you have anything like that, like if you're pointing to a broken website or a broken link, that's going to that's going to cause issues. You know, uh, actually, SendGrid has a very a pretty good guide on on email deliverability. So I'll just paste that in here as well, so you guys can see it. So that's sendgridcom slash resource slash email dash deliverability. Uh, and this is a pretty good guide to teach you um, how, to, how to get better um, sending. But then there's some other cool techniques that we can work on as well. So for example, use HTML and images sparingly. All right? You need to make sure that you have a high text to, to HTML ratio, which is why earlier on when I was talking about the spam button, that, that's one of the things that when you, you, know, you check spam score, that's one of the things that will notify you if you're using too much HTML. Um, generally add as few hyperlinks to an email as possible, right? So one is a, is a normal practice if your email is very short. If you're only sending one or two paragraphs, just add one hyperlink. It, you don't want to like, I know that sometimes people try and bomb you with lots of links to click. Um, but if, you, if you're promoting one thing, add one hyperlink. And, and try and keep it to two or three maximum. The more links you put in there, the more, of, the more it looks like a marketing copy and the more likely you are to hit the promotions box or, or so on, okay? Um, and now a very big one and a very key one is to encourage recipients to reply to emails. So always try and get them to reply back to you and give them reasons to reply back. Say, you know, so in a lot of my emails that I send, I say, PS, any questions, simply hit reply and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. That's a simple standard one, but you can really push the boundary a lot further to try and get people to reply. If you get replies back, that's going to be great for your sender reputation and it's going to be great for your inboxing. So you could say, you know, maybe you send an email like, how's your day going? Please reply. I'm, I'm very interested to know how things are with you. Any, any updates in your business? Let me know how I can help. Um, you know, anything that gets a reply is, is going to be pretty powerful. Um, obviously, another important one would be telling them to move you from a promotions box to the inbox. Because if they do that once, then you'll always land in the inbox after that. Okay, So giving them instructions on what to do. Uh, the other thing is don't ever use no reply at email addresses. Okay, Use an email address that you actually manage. And that's the other thing. If they do reply to you, you should reply back to them as well. So then you've got an email chain going. You've got a thread going. So it doesn't look like it's automated outreach. And that, that's very powerful um, in terms of deliverability uh, signal. But if you use the word no reply, even if it is a reply email address, don't use no reply. Um, it's very important that you have a proper email address that people reply to. And in Platform, we have it set up that it has to be like, you need to confirm the email address as the reply to address. Uh, once again, that's to ensure that you get high, highest deliverability rates possible, okay? So there's, uh, there's uh, other metrics that are taken into consideration, okay? So you've got your campaign level metrics, which is your open rate, click-through rates, and click-to-open rates, etc. all right? So all of that is tracked, and, and then that determines your kind of sender reputation on, on your domain. Um, but then there's also business attribution metrics, which basically means, you know, what percentage of sales or registrations can be attributed to email actions, okay? These are, these are hidden metrics that are taken into consideration. Uh, what percentage of your recipients have opened or clicked or taken other action in the last X days? These are things that you can do with the filters that we're talking about on the contacts page. And also understanding that your campaign performance um, will be very difficult if you don't know your inbox placement rate, okay? So, so guys, the other thing is to send a welcome email. When a subscriber opts into your newsletter or purchases a product from you, always send them a welcome email to give a great first impression and start a relationship and immediately ask them to reply to that as well as we are talking about before. Um, and obviously the a very obvious one is when they opt in on the thank you opt-in page or anything like that, ask them to whitelist your email address, tell them to add it to your, you know, um, their address book so that they will re always receive your replies later. And um, yeah, we talked about using email list verify. That's another option. Uh, so Sampath, is, is that, I just rushed through there because we're running late to try and give some more information about things that people can do. Uh, mm -hmm. But we, we plan on probably, I guess we could turn this into a PDF and sending it out to people. Um, yep. But how, how was that? Was there information there? Was there value? 
Yep, yep, that definitely does. And yeah, I, I mean, like the way uh, you have explained that, I don't feel that that's rushing. Basically, you have shared the information that we wanted to, so that's completely fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, so just to recap, it's important um, to make sure that you keep keep these guys, like when you're emailing them, keep, you know, make sure that they are active, that they're opening your emails. And if they stop opening your emails, launch a reenactive re campaign. And if they don't respond to that, then probably unsubscribe them and stop mailing them because it's just affecting your your sender score and your and your results uh, adversely. So it, it's the problem with email list sizes is a vanity metric. Uh, you know, if people say, "Oh, my email list is 100,000," well, that's great. With how many open your emails and how many click your links, that's all that matters. And you'll notice that if you remove the deadwood, obviously your your open and click rates go up a lot, but also the amount of mail that actually makes it to the inbox increases as well. So, so it's very much in your interest to keep keep your mail, um, use good list hygiene and keep your mailing lists clean. Um, then obviously using a service like Email List Verify helps as well. And also encouraging replies, encouraging them to um, whitelist your email, uh, encouraging any sort of interaction with you, and then ensuring that you're not sending to any broken links uh, and so on. So, that, that's kind of the, the main things that you guys can do. And then obviously checking the spam score before you send an email to make sure that your HTML ratio is, is decent, that you're not using too many spam keywords in there, um, and so on and so forth. And that's, that's obviously another thing as well. And what you can do is you can also test different content. So what you can do is you, you create an email, and then once you've got the email, then you come to your contacts and you search for yourself. And then from here, you click here and you go send email. And you send the email and you see where it places. Okay, and if it does land in spam or promotions or whatever, you come back, you tweak the email copy, you remove one of the hyperlinks, you, you take out some of the HTML, you fix up um, any any overly spammy words that are used, you kind of remove those or whatever, and then you test again until you hit the inbox. Uh, that that that's another little technique that you could use. And um, we have uh, one last question from Sasha. So when your sender email is different from the reply email, would that not hurt your sender score? Uh, no, no, I don't. Sorry, I'm, I'm hearing myself there. Sometimes. Okay. Um, no, it, it won't because both of them are verified and both of them are active. You can, you can set them to be the same, but because if you're mailing through the platform system, we're signing the mail on, on your behalf. So it, it, it doesn't matter. You can use different ones. Great. I think uh, that will be the last question that we'll be taking because we have been like, running beyond the schedule. Yeah. So uh, Colin, is there something that you want to add or we can just wind up? Uh, from my side, I think we can wind up. I just wanted to thank everyone for joining and asking questions. Um, and if you're watching this on a replay, if you have any other questions, do reach out to us on the help desk. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Great. So uh, thank you once again for uh, everyone who has joined us today and asked like really, really good questions. So we'll just keep the webinar series keep going. Uh, there will be like a lot more uh, value webinars from platform is going to come up. Uh, in fact, we have planned one to do, especially on like lead scoring. So the first thing we are going to ask you is to start using lead scoring, start using more features of Platformly so that uh, we can make uh, next webinars and all the upcoming webinars like more interactive and you can bring in like more interesting questions because Platform is like, uh, it, it, it's like a heavily uh, loaded tool with like tons of options for every single feature they have built. So start using more. You can always check out the what's new section to see what are the new updates they have rolled out. And uh, Colin has also mentioned that they are going to send emails every month to uh, notify us on the updates they have been rolling out. And uh, Colin, I'm not sure if I'm the right guy to say this, uh, but Platformly, they have recently recruited uh, a CMO as well. So who will be like uh, taking care of like, a lot of marketing operations. So we will be constantly communicated. So that is one of the uh, keys of uh, when it comes to marketing, like communicating with the users. Uh, at regular intervals. So we'll be communicated more about the uh, features they have rolled out, things they are working on. So we can expect like more updates from Platformly. So the biggest request from my end and from Colin's end is to start 
using more features, start putting platform into use for different use cases and come to us with like more questions and more suggestions. We are always open. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, thank you once again, everyone. And thank you, Colin, for making time, uh, despite like flying back and forth. And thank you, everyone, for staying back beyond the schedule. And see you all in the next webinar. Cheers. Thank you, Colin. Cheers. Cheers.